Perhaps I should, let me just, uh, it looks like it just bleeped out for a second. Where's my power? Well, this is our first slide. It's very conceptual. It's very conceptual. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an artist. Is this your concept or more like your background? <laughs> I feel like it's more of a frame. Clearly, this is art that isn't a game. It's a blank slate. We're not, we're, I don't think we're, we're going to. There we go. Does that work? Is that work? Is that work? I think so. Is that, uh, that? There you go. It's like smaller now, weird. Okay, you just don't touch it. Oh, yeah, can we, get, can we get some high contrast in here? Exits are in the front and the back. <laughs> so, hey everyone, um, I'm Seth Alter. I'm one of the uh, organizers of Boston Indies. I'm Julian, hi. I'm an artist. Um, so this is uh, Stop, Stop Remaking Mario, and to uh, explain specifically what this title means, uh, let's talk for, for just a sec about right, so the old topic, uh, which is, uh, arrow keys not working, hold on. Um, uh, in, the, in the game, the movie, everyone's uh, heard of this before? This is, uh, uh, in the game, the movie was a documentary that came out, I think 2008 or nine. That's a lot of flicker, isn't it? Is that there? Can we uh, get that out of the screen and see if that helps? Oh, yeah. it just went away forever. Huh? Check the physical connection. Yeah. Smash the laptop. This laptop is not in the, uh, Step on. Best condition. Yeah, I think that's a that's a high impedance air gap somewhere in there. A what? <laughs> high, high impedance air gap. Take your word for it. Just an old AV term. Um, I don't know. What do you, you think we can roll with it? No one minds. Can everybody just Does your anybody here more? have any <laughs> concerns you about seizures or anything? We'll see. <laughs> if you have to leave because it's giving you the game, the movie. Uh, it was a documentary, came out in uh, 2008 or 9, and it was supposed to be about like, indie game development in general, and it follows uh, three different developers making three different games. Um, it's sort of like an iconic um, uh, thing that, that, that sort of is supposed to sum up the zeitgeist at the moment. Um, and like, it's okay in my opinion, but like, like all, all three games are Mario. Like, like all of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> What's the treehouse Mario? Like there, this is Fez, Super Meat Boy, and Bray. So you got like Fez is like Mario with like a cool 3D thing, and and Super Meat Boy is is Mario with with wall jumping, and Bray is Mario with John Blow. And, <laughs> <laughs> but like essentially they're all the same game. Like you're still jumping around, like like you know do, doing basically the same mechanics, and like that's that's fine. I don't have a problem with platformers specifically. I'm I'm just saying that like. Like, if, is this, apparently this is what we mean when we say an indie game. We mean three variations on the exact same thing that's been around since the, since, uh, the, the, the dawn of the medium. Um, we mostly make remakes, in other words. And, and we, we could be doing a lot better than that. And, and uh, we, we got to break out of the mode. And um, the fastest way to do that, actually, is to listen to what other people in other fields are doing. Yeah, listen to me. <laughs> uh, Hi, I'm uh, Julian, and I do a lot of different stuff. Uh, I'm an artist. I uh, have my uh, dual degree in the Studio for Interrelated Media, also known as the Studio for Imaginary Majors or Underwater Basket Weaving uh, from Mass College of Art. I also have a second degree in art history from there. Um, what that means is I'm like a digital artist with the most loosest of definitions. Um, I'm also a writer, so some books I've done and contributed to. Uh, on the left here is uh, the collection, Short Fiction from the Transgender Vanguard, I put that up because it won a Lambda Literary Award a few years ago, which is um, one of the highest honors in LGBT books. And this is the most recent thing that I was in, the Procyon Press Science Fiction Anthology, which is uh, totally still going to be a sleeper hit. You should check it out. Um, so I write science fiction and fantasy about my sad gay feelings. And um, <laughs> I'm also a sound designer. Um, this is a production photo from Astro Boy and the God of Comics uh, at Company One Theater. Um, 
this particular production won an Elliot Norton Award, which is like the Tonys for regional theater. I was the sound designer on that, so the whole production team kind of won that award collectively. It was a super huge honor. I got to wear a fancy outfit and go on a stage and shit like that. Um, but I also do um, sound design for a couple of other things. Most recently I've been working with uh, an audio games company called Earplay, and uh, we just finished um, a project for, uh, I guess, White Wolf. Um, I don't know exactly how to explain that whole world because I'm not an RPG nerd by background. Dark and edgy. Dark and edgy. Um, it's very cool. Uh, I was really excited to work on that. So I do like audio games and theater design and a lot of other shit too, um, but that's just who I am. So I'm Seth. Most of what I do is uh, game development. Uh, this is to be one of my first Boston Indies with uh, Big Mike and I, were, I think I just, just had given a talk on educational games. Um, and uh, I've released two titles on Steam. I tend to make games that are uh, uh, satirical and, and have a lot of commentary about the real world. So my first title is uh, Neocolonialism, which is uh, a game where you try to extract as much wealth from the world as possible, or at least more than everyone else, and siphon it into secret Swiss bank account. Um, this. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, I was able to successfully kickstart this one. I got a, uh, a pretty small niche audience for whom this was sort of like the game they'd been waiting for for ages. Um, in general, gamers uh, didn't like it. Uh, they thought the graphics sucked, uh, the AI is dumb, which is fair, um, and they thought uh, the game was too slow and short. Um, my next title was No Pineapple Left Behind, which is a, uh, a school simulator where you uh, uh, try to dehumanize kids and do tropical fruit in order to make money. <laughs> um, it's pretty work. So pineapples, all they do is take tests and get grades. They're, they're actually quite simple, but they could, uh, you could also have children. Children are very complicated and have wants and needs and feelings, which will impact your school budget because they aren't doing their homework. How did you get um, Frank set up at the end of the game? This is this is a screenshot. So it, uh, no pineapple left behind got got some mixed reviews. I I have been told that apparently everyone in Denmark knows about it, but by reason to, to be skeptical of this. World famous in Denmark. World famous in Denmark, exactly. Uh, gamers again um, thought that this game tends to be too boring. The graphics sucked. Um, and, and um, the UI could be finicky. Um, when in fact, uh, the point of the game was to be difficult, soul-sucking, and boring. Um, I make projects that, that aren't fun. I, I, <laughs> and I, and I don't intend for them to be fun. Um, in, in most other mediums, if you were to list off, like, say, your top 10 movies, like, it's, it's probable that, that one of those is not like, a fun movie, but, but uh, still worth watching. So I, I try to aim for that sort of thing. Um, this is me uh, at, at GBC uh, uh, showcasing No Pineapple Left Behind. You can tell it's No Pineapple Left Behind uh, on account of the pineapple. <laughs> oh, it's the Bemis Center. It's the Bemis Center. So um, we met a, a couple years ago. Um, uh, you were doing a show called Weird, Fantastic, and Sublime. That over I at Oberon in, in Harvard Square. Uh, and, and I had, uh, there was a friend of mine that was performing there, so I was like, oh, cool, I'll go, I'll go see and check it out. And it was an exceptional event. Thanks. I thought it was great. And I was like, it's a sci-fi show. I was like, who made this? And, and we met, I was like, and we wanted to, to uh, collaborate as artists. Uh, instead, we fell in love and became boyfriends. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and at some point you were like, hey, you want to apply an art residency? I was like, what the hell is an art residency? Good uh, question. So Funny you should ask. Yeah, we ended we up in an art residency in Omaha for three months, and, and our first piece of the talk is uh, what, what that even was. I can't tell if this is a picture of the building or a render of the building. I think it's a picture, but it's like, it's very, it's, it's a little bit like, I don't know, there's no dust. So this is, a, this is an old 19th century factory building, and uh, Omaha was uh, a huge center of uh, meat packing and... Um... Uh, you play as a artificial intelligence with a human lover, and uh, you want to have a body to be with the human lover, so, so the lover and their buddy go off on a quest uh, throughout New Jersey looking for body parts off of Craigslist. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're software and you're trying to basically um, build yourself a corpus. 
uh, through the sketchy available means <laughs> so there. that you can uh, snuggle. <laughs> so uh, I, I did uh, all the uh, Unity work and uh, map design and, and integration of all the systems. And I was also just the Jersey consulting because that's where I'm from. So for, we have right now, as you can see, we got the city and we have Philly, which is, which is the deep, deep Jersey way of, of uh, understanding the world. This is uh, what it looks like usually when you're going around. So you, uh, you click around the screen uh, to, to try to navigate the, the highways and, and uh, inevitably turn off on the wrong exit because it's New Jersey. Um, and then periodically uh, you'll hit the... Uh, periodically you'll hit little uh, invisible marks on the map that um, will trigger different IF uh, segments and stuff like that. And so I did a lot of the... Uh, well, I did all the, the writing and I did the, um, the sound design for this. Uh, so um, that was a lot of fun. I, it, I decided to write this project from the point of view of the AI. There are a lot of movies and novels and sci-fi stuff out there about um, robots and AIs and things like that and their relationships with humans. That, that's like a genre that already exists. But more often than not, they're kind of from a very human perspective. Either the AI really wants to be a human or the human really wants the AI to be a human so it can fuck it. Um, and stuff like that, uh, and I kind of, I kind of wanted to be like, well, what if a piece of software wanted to be with a human but didn't want to be human, and uh, had to deal with, you know, nonetheless, like there's, there's a limit to what you can do when you say I'm going to make my own body from scratch. If you want to um, better exist in a human society, that uh, brings with it all kinds of fucked up limitations. So you can't actually just be a beautiful hell beast. Um, you have to think about, uh, you know, where you're sourcing these materials from. You have to think about things like gender. You have to think about things like race, and um, you know, kind of like for the first time because you've never had a body before, that kind of thing. So it's it's kind of, um, you know, it, it was a, it was a story exercise for me in taking a very old trope and um, having uh, some more fun with it, which is that like, yeah, they want to be together, but the the, the central question isn't really like, can a robot boy learn to love? It's like, um, Cause yes. And like, can getting body parts off Craigslist not be kind of weird? Like, <laughs> so you end up like, you know, uh, kind of interacting with these these townspeople in different um, extremes of New Jersey. And we picked New Jersey because. Um, it's such a microcosm of all the problems in the rest of the world. Uh, and there's, there's areas of extraordinary poverty and areas of extraordinary wealth. And anything that could be wrong with the world it exists in New Jersey. And so I love it. Uh, we, you know, we wanted to kind of explore that. You, like, you see an ad on Craigslist, you go to get the thing, and then you know it's like, well, I didn't agree to this. Like, there's like a whole character experience on the other end for you. Um, and so that, that was the other kind of um, compelling motivation for sure. the story. Now, um, that all being said, first off, uh, we didn't finish it as per, you know, we didn't have to, so we, we had like a... <laughs> we did the first part. <laughs> uh, we, yeah, we got, we got most of the way through the first part, um, and, and we're not sure if this will ever end up seeing the light of day. Uh, a lot of this is definitely a first draft, and a lot of this uh, was to just figure out how to work together because we've never done it before. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like we'd known each other for a little bit. People like would go up to us and like, how long have you been in our, uh, 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 a group? And we were like, oh, since like yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got <laughs> mistaken for childhood friends uh, more than once there. People in, people also don't know how to parse us because um, they don't know if I'm a boy or a girl and they really want to know to figure out what Seth's deal is. And so they're just like, you're just good friends. And we're like, yeah, like the Kashi box, yeah. <laughs> Good friends who, yeah. Um, right. So, um, uh, after, guys after, dudes. Now, after all of this, I, uh, it, it uh, sort of the big takeaway for me was um, rethinking myself uh, as an artist. Now, I know, I know far less than you about art. I think that's fair to say. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I went to art school. I, I don't know anything about art, but uh, there's, there's this whole like, concept of framing which is, is very similar to marketing, um, where if, if, I, if I frame my existing work without changing any of it as art and, and pitch it accordingly to artists, um, it's actually much better received, was, was a big takeaway for me. Uh, people really, really liked our stuff. Yeah, they did. Like, they were like, oh, contemporary art, okay. Like, it, 
as I, like we we were told by curators that like of like the thousand people that applied, of the twelve people that got in, ours was the one that stood out. Yeah, which was really cool. Um, I find the artists of game devs do like my work, and, and uh, gamers generally don't, which is it turns out fine because there's this whole other thing I, I could be thinking about. Um, the work that we do is uh, t not not a, not visual. We don't neither of us are visual artists, and uh, in our case, it actually made it, makes it stand out a lot because we have a whole other emphasis. Um, yeah, that's... Seth brings a, a big emphasis on like systems design, kind of as a as a interactive point, and I'm coming from a point of view of, of narrative and on audio and and to a lesser extent I'm, I'm thinking about um, like I'm not actually a visual person I went to visual art school and became a sound designer so like that's your first clue <laughs> uh, and and for me like I, I love visual arts but I'm always more interested in all the other things going on and so for me text and audio and alternate controls and alternate ways of you know, introducing a story, or they're just interesting to me, and part of that is my own learning disabilities, and but part of that is theoretical. So, so what got, what got me thinking about this is those that, um, with, with regards to my own work, as well as potentially your work, um, like, like what I'm doing doesn't necessarily have to be a video game. It doesn't have to be framed as a video game, it doesn't have to be designed as a video game, uh, and neither does yours, and there's going to be people that are actually quite interested in that stuff. You could be an artist already. If you just rebrand it, um, the art world is is uh, not categorically interested in video games per se. Um, there are a few uh, 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 very uh, uh, cliches that that it's like it's it, they, they don't like cliches over there. We were told when we got there that like literally two thirds of the applications involved either uh, disembodied spectral lady hands, like vaporwave hands or uh, dystopian cityscapes, but like those two in particular were like actually two-thirds of a thousand applications, which is <laughs> like, what? Like, oh, um, and, and British voiceovers. Yes, that was the third one. British way. voices talking over things, which mm. makes it science-y. So <laughs> they, and they, and they turned those all down with one exception, but like that was... No, no, but the guy that they let in was really good. He was really good. So like, they, they're, they're not super interested in people that, that are doing uh, the same things that they've seen before. Um, the art world um, is, is potentially interested in very, uh, video games. They're definitely not interested in another freaking Mario remake. Um, uh, which <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I could add to this is that, um, you know, whether you think it's ridiculous or not, uh, contemporary art is very interested in concept and experiment um, and, and just like examples of things that could be, maybe even more so than something that looks like a highly polished, um, you know, complete project. And so if you, if you find yourself very interested in making games that are kind of like thought experiments or, or just like kind of beautiful and go nowhere and you're like, I don't know what this is, I better add something to it, like maybe you don't need to. You actually, that could be fine, you know, um, and respect the size of your ideas. There's no such thing as like a, a, a complete idea and an incomplete idea. There's just something you finish and something you don't. So, you know, um, like if, if you have a weird misfit thing, like it, it's it's not your fault. There's nothing wrong with you. It's it's that there's this idea that like to be a game, it has to have X, Y, and Z. And like, Absolutely. fine, maybe it's not a game. Who cares, you know? Absolutely. Um, so with this disclaimer to that, um, this uh, none of what I'm about to say is, is, is it a personal attack on you or your work. You're all great. Your work is, is really cool, um, and and nothing that I'm going to say is is necessarily about about making money. Um, I hard to make money in the indie game world as is. Um, marketing uh, and business and press kits and that sort of thing are are very important to get by, and uh, that's true for sustaining an art career as it is for a game dev career. But uh, specifically, the dream of having like a breakout hit uh, that everyone's going to purchase and make you lots of money, we're going to just table that for the rest of this talk um, and, and talk about something that's, that's uh, largely irrelevant to that. Uh, so that being said, from my uh, vantage point, uh, video games, uh, they, they, they uh, tend to employ the same mechanics and tropes and, and visual effects over and over and over and over again to the point where like we've optimized um, maybe three things really, really well. Uh, we've optimized this. We're very good at this. We're very good at killing a man. Uh, we're very good at this. Boobies. 
uh, and we're very good at this. Jumping on shit. Uh, and I think that's it. Like, like, like that's that's what we're best at by far. Um, like, like we've got other things we're very good at, but like that's that's sort of the aggregate. My um, personal favorite is the big booby ladies. <laughs> as, I think video games need more of those. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, as a caveat, I, I should say that um, uh, making Mario games is actually a very good way to learn how to make games and learn uh, form and design because they're actually so well understood. So if you're trying to do like a first project, like this is an excellent way to step into the thing. Um, I, I, as learning tool, it's great, but but we are in fact stuck with these handful of, of motifs and cliches and, and effects over and over and over. Uh, and these are just the obvious examples. I'm sure we could come up with like you know 200 other ones that like you know Dark Battle Five is is using in this or, or whatever the name of the game is. I mean I don't I don't know what a video game is, uh, but uh, you know like it. So I come from a world where you spend the first few years of your studies actually copying things that are already considered good, and so you um, you will draw the same statue or the same great painting. Uh, and make, make copies of it as a student maybe hundreds of times before your, your art teacher wants to see anything of your own composition. And like, there's absolutely value in understanding those rules and going there. And I do value that. Um, but you know, there's, there's also some limitations to it too. With Mario specifically, like, like there is actually art Mario already. Um, uh, what's that guy's name? Courier Archangel. Courier Archangel made like, haunted Mario ROM, like it's like a piece, it's like 15 years old, it's, it's already kind of a thing, and so like, you know, I think it's, it, Mario has an existential crisis as the world melts around him, I don't know. Yeah, what's that weird one coming out, like? I don't know. Yeah, or, or you're talking about Choreography, I thought yeah. you were talking about Mario Odyssey. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mario Odyssey is really strange. <laughs> <laughs> it's the people who make Mario should stop remaking Mario. Absolutely. Um, but anyway, uh, that's just a side. So yeah, I mean, like, bottom line, what I'm trying to say with this whole thing is like, what, like, actually, I'm posing this to all of you, like, why, why are we adhering to this strict framework of of what it means to make a video game? Why do we have all these rules and designs? Again, we're, we're tabling breakout hit for a second because that's a very good a answer. Um, but like, well, like we, we, we could we could break any number of the rules and, and make something that's like, sure, maybe not a video game, it's just this weird thing that we use some of the design principles that we've been learning all these years. Like, what if there was no success? And by success, I don't necessarily mean winning. Like, there's success in Tetris, right? Like, there's a way to succeed in Tetris and like, eventually you're going to lose. Like, what if there was no success? Or what if you could only play it in certain places, such as uh, a gallery setting? Uh, what if it was more than electronic, but like partly electronic? Uh, what These it, last two bullet points were mine. <laughs> right. <laughs> what if we fucking dealt with our issues before sublimating them into our professions? And what if God was one of us? That's all. So, um, uh, now, like to to, uh, to to think about these things is is to is to go uh, you know uh, against like a lot of basic principles and. Uh, it, it can feel like like we, we might have to end up uh, reinventing the wheel. Like, how would we even go about doing this? Like, could we could we possibly redesign all these uh, different like relatively deep structures um, that that uh, and, and like figure it out on our own? And the answer is like, no, we don't really have to. Um, other disciplines have actually figured out a lot of this, uh, and and we don't pull from them uh, nearly enough. Oh, I'm supposed to talk about other disciplines. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, there's this whole thing uh, like about theories of play, and um, when I say that, I don't mean uh, theories of how games work. I literally mean like child development specialists who have been from like the 1970s, like onwards, studying groups of preschoolers, like making up their own games in the schoolyard and writing about like actually how play works. Play. Um, uh, probably one of the most famous people from this field is Bernie Coven. He's still alive. He's on Twitter. He's a, a joyful human being, and um, he loves to chat. Um, and these are this is sort of like a, a thing worth going into. He he's written a lot of books about like how to make up games with available materials, how to um, you know examine you know what's uh, competitive, what's cooperation, all these different things. And I, I think there's uh, there's a lot to be learned from kind of understanding like what people, when they're very small and still learning, um, kind of gravitate towards naturally. Um, I think one of the things that kind of turns me off sometimes when I read video game theory is it, it makes it sound like it wants to turn human behavior into this like really measurable thing where like 
people like this in games because it rewards their pleasure centers. And I'm like, I don't know, people like all kinds of stuff. Um, I like playing video games with really beautiful background art so that I can put my point of view character in front of a nice vista and just like look at it for a while. Uh, I, you know, I don't necessarily play them for the same reason another person plays them and like that's fine. So to kind of like go down the, the rabbit hole of like why people enjoy and how they play, period. Um, digital art, uh, computer art, stuff like that. In the fine arts world, um, it's been around since as long as there's been computers and not all of it's a game, but uh, there's a lot of really uh, great stuff, a lot of cutting edge um, graphics and music that we now take for granted and, and see integrated in other forms of media originally came out of completely experimental forms. Um, it can be funny, it can be personal, it can be you know, playable. Um, uh, theater, uh, which is one of the industries that I work in, has been doing what we call immersion and interactivity for like, see a play, really. If you're not into theater um, or you've never seen a play in your life, and I know uh, from working in theater that most people have never seen a play, I think, um, it's, it's worth checking out. Uh, there's, you know, um, a lot of stuff going on in Boston that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, it's, it's a lot more than, I guess I wrote that. Um, so aesthetics, by which I mean like art decisions, design decisions, are always political, always, always, always. Um, this doesn't mean that like a floating red cube always equals communism, that's not what I mean. Um, what I mean is that design decisions never happen in a vacuum, there's no such thing as it's just a preference, it, that's not real. Um, design decisions are always, whether you know it or not, in conversation with other people's design decisions and the connotations that people have with those design decisions. And so this is what we kind of mean when we're like, like certain kinds of art and certain kinds of things just get like so heavily associated with types of governments or with types of people or subcultures. Um, there's always politics attached and it's in your favor to actually know who you're talking to. So you could make something and you're like, I just really like this, you know, um, but you might, not know necessarily all the references you're pulling. And so it's good to kind of have a more broad understanding of other types of arts because um, you might be surprised or humiliated or delighted to find out who your actual contemporaries are outside of games. Um, it's okay to think weird modern art is bad or not for you, um, but I do want to emphasize that uh, the aura of pretentiousness and intellectualism around it is completely manufactured by people who need to sell it. Um, and first year art students, and it's, it's not actually inaccessible. Um, uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to make art seem like something that can only be viewed in a cleanly white box that you pay a lot of money to get into with nice lighting. And the reality is that, you know, actually, you know, art is for everyone. And there's this, there's this old uh, British TV series, it's only four episodes long. Uh, it's from the 1970s, it's called Ways of Seeing. It's uh, free online, you can go watch it. Um, and there's a great segment in the first episode where the host, this man named John Berger, who just recently died, who was a fantastic um, art critic, artist, writer, he was sort of a renaissance man, um, gives a, like a Caravaggio painting, like a, like a big fancy important painting to a group of school children and they do a better job of interpreting it than the official art history text that like is in this <laughs> textbook because people have like a very intuitive relationship to art. So if you, feel, if you feel that things have been like made not for you in your life for any reason, if it seems like it's for people who are smarter than you or people who are richer than you or people who know more than you, that's actually all crap and um, it's, it's all for you. So please don't be self-censored and be afraid to look at things. That's all I got for that. Things, uh, especially when they're things you wanna do that are fun. So uh, to kind of put that self-censorship aside and be like, well, I'm an artist now, I'm making a weird thing, and I'm gonna apply to a fucking art residency. Yeah, like if you wanna do that, um, there's a way to contextualize your work to do it and to not be afraid to do that. Um, yeah, that's sort of all I have to say about this slide. At this point, uh, having been to the Bemis Center, um, and, and I encourage everyone uh, to do the same, that, that you, you, you could just make weird stuff. Uh, oh yeah, Cautions. Um, I wrote this slide. Um, subcultures also have norms, um, by which I mean that in the indie world it's very easy to compare yourself to a uh, mainstream of the industry and think, you know, aha, me and all 50 of my friends are doing the same cutting edge thing. But, <laughs> um, you know, also just to kind of be aware that um, 
stuff becomes self-perpetuating really quick, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad, but um, I do find like-minded people, but do be aware that like, you know, uh, the insider outsider mentality is kind of, uh, it's very real for me. And, you know, like a few years ago, I was really into twine games and, and very, very quickly, you know, does anybody know what I mean when I say twine games? Yes. Twine, twine was like a, um, it was like a, almost like an uh, interactive fiction game making thing, but it worked like HTML, everything kind of felt like a website and it was, uh, really, really easy to use to make games and, and very quickly twine took on its own subculture. Um, at the time, this was really exciting for me because I really liked making games using HTML and CSS. This was the language that I knew, and finally, and I really liked things that were text-based. But um, within like two years, like there was like a Twine game, like capital T, capital G, and um, and that became sort of something that was really odd. And so instead of just being like a way of making games, it had kind of a cultural moment a few years ago where like a couple of particular creators became like defining for the twine things. And for some people that was really great, and for other people that was really alienating because it was just like, oh, but now I'm making twine games wrong. And it's like, no, <laughs> like, this is like a subculture of a subculture. Like, so just sort of just be aware of that kind of thing. Um, I put empathy as a dubious goal on here because a lot of times when we talk about storytelling mediums and um, interactive mediums, uh, people, uh, are like, oh, well, the point of this is to feel X feeling, or the point of this is to have this kind of experience. Um, and, and increasingly, I see a lot of things that call themselves empathy games that are kind of on the line between art and games. And these are sort of um, pieces of digital media that are trying to get you to experience like somebody else's experience. I think this is a really uh, dubious goal. And I just want to sort of have you be aware that when you when you are messing with other people's experience, or you know, with with this with this goal of like, I want to produce a certain number, of, like certain kind of emotion, in your work that um that like that that's just kind of like a weird thing, and it's like a thing I've seen a lot kind of in in that space between games and art. Um, whereas in the art world, like you know, the artist might have a statement that's like, I'm hoping to produce this feeling in the viewer, but really like people are going to get anything they want out of your work. You could you could make a you could make a a beautiful game that's like I want people to learn to, you know, value how beautiful the color red is, and they could walk away from it just being like, man, like Beethoven was so cool. Like people will just <laughs> like whatever, right? Um, uh, the most effective way to do this um, is is to uh, both to uh, get out and see things you haven't seen before and do things you haven't done before, and then potentially to chat and even work with people outside of this discipline. Um, there, there's a ton of, of ideas out there uh, that uh, we're, we in video games are really, really struggling with um, that, that like, people have like, fought through for hundreds of years and like, they know how to do this, or if they don't know how to do this, they've argued about it a lot. Yeah, there's um, a lot. Of there's there's, there's a lot. Art is mostly arguing with pictures. And when you work with these new people, if you work with these new people, be a good friend like you would here. Like, like be, be friendly with people. Try to get new buddies that are outside of the video game dev world and in, in, in the art world. Um, and, and just look beyond games for inspiration. Make something that's kind of a game, but, but kind of something else. Make something weird. Be yourself. Because of the fact that I can't really document it the way that you document a video game, and it's not really captured in the same way. It's experiential. So is it more meaningful or less meaningful to do that? Or do you think that it should be documented in some way? Um, so I can tell you that uh, I share your pain with this. Um, it's really hard to be a sound artist and show documentation <laughs> of your work. And in theater in particular, like photos, and videos of a play happening are actually property of the theater company. And so you can't usually like just show like a full minute of something without like permission from the set designer because there are works in the video too and stuff like that. And you've done theater stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you know you know this. Um, so it's very hard to document certain types of things um, for legal reasons, for uh, interdimensional reasons, like I don't know how you how you document a LARP. Yeah. Right? Um, it, it, it always looks stupid. It always looks, it always looks weird. It just it's hard to present. Um, 
I don't think there's really like a, a meaningfulness thing. I think uh, though that we need to um, to get inventive and defiant about what we mean by documentation. Mm -hmm. Documentation has a very photography implicit meaning to it, and like a very like big macro beautiful photo mm -hmm. where you can kind of immediately understand everything going on. But um, you know. Uh, your documentation doesn't have to look like that. Um, your documentation could be uh, the in-character diaries that everybody there kept for the weekend. You know, your documentation could take the form of, you know, um, impressions that your audience had. Um, that counts as documentation, as far as I'm concerned. And as to your actual question, which is like, is it more or less meaningful? Uh, I don't think it's more or less meaningful. I think, I think experiential art is kind of what you're describing. Yeah. Um, is really difficult to pin down. You know, a live experience is is fundamentally different. From I think that uh, first off, it has to be said that those two games still represent a very niche um, portion of the market that, like, actually not many people know about it. Um, I believe this Warpmine, like, they they almost went under. Like, they actually didn't sell very well. Uh, that, that was uh, at least the rumor going around. I'm not sure uh, how how true that is. Paper Squeeze, I did, I think, did actually very well. They are put on the uh, NPR, so like... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... Bye, thanks for coming. I think, again, the, um, the, the, the way out with that might be to not try to fight directly against Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto, but to try to come up with this like new in-between state um, that's like part video game, part something else that's like doesn't, doesn't have to be fun because it's not even a video game at this point. Uh, and I, I think go in that direction. I have a weird question for everyone here about video games because I'm sort of an outsider to video games in my own mind. Um, like, like if you have like a decorative clay bowl in your house that does nothing but look pretty, and then you also have a cereal bowl that you eat cereal out of every morning, do your friends come over and look at your decorative bowl and go, "That's not really a bowl"? Like, <laughs> why do video games have this like that's not a game? And though a small art town has. Tons of opportunities. There's, there's actually a Twitter, Boston Area Artists, great Twitter to follow. There's calls for work all the time. And uh, increasingly, people are like open to interactive and non you know, dimensional work or interdimensional work or like whatever. Just literally send it to the context that you want to see it in. This is more of a comment, but I guess it could also be a question. But I game fun elements with a more artistic or meaningful type event. For example, Hotline Miami, which makes you think about the violence you're committing while giving you lots of violence. I mean, um, I guess, I guess to, to clarify, since we were, we were uh, We've been using art really tongue-in-cheek. It doesn't have to be serious to be art. I mean, I, to, to, to clarify, I personally make games that aren't fun. Um, you, you could make artistic games that, that are. I make fun art. I make things that are definitely not video games and are still fun. I make video games that are definitely not fun. <laughs> that's not fun. That's, that's the big takeaway here. I'm not going to answer that anymore. <laughs> um, no, it's a good question. Um, I, I think for me personally these days I'm skewing towards, towards more finicky arty, artsy projects that, that, that aren't necessarily like a, a, a sense of fun. Um, with the possible exception of Grim Fandango, which is just great. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm working for a company right now making um, cool cool ghost sounds for, for so you can talk to your uh, Amazon Echo and have it haunt you. I don't know. I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> like you could go, I mean, this is, again, like, that's, that's, that's sort of just my, my own aesthetic these days. Uh, I, I was not by any means like the only way to do anything. You talked earlier about bringing interactive experiences um, with, like, to the art world, uh, and you also mentioned galleries have calls for work. Are there other avenues that we should be looking into to kind of take to step outside our uh, like our little area? Yeah. Um, for one thing, we we there are other groups analogous to this. Um, art collectives and stuff that we, we could be uh, doing some sort of like joint meetup with, uh, getting to know people.
uh, of going to art residencies, which we were talking about. But um, yeah, I think that they, that that they're they're every bit as uh, organized as we are. Sure. I guess in terms of like, if I were to look for stuff, galleries, calls for work. Uh, what else should be like keywords that we would look for? Oh, good question. Um, so galleries and museums are one avenue of many, mm -hmm. um, but there's. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of like uh, student and uh, institutional collaborative groups that just get together to kind of like have fun with stuff. Um, there's art spaces. So like right after I graduated Mass Art, so I didn't get to take part in this, and I'm very super jealous. But um, a bunch of students from my program um, just kind of like hit up the Museum of Science, and they're like, "Hey, hey, you know that big Omni Dome in your planetarium? Can we like?" put other stuff on it besides planets. And they did, like, the Museum of Science, apparently, you can actually rent the Omni Theater for, like, the night, um, and, and do collaborative projects there. And there's a whole different set of specifications to making things for a dome. Um, and it's, it's, of course, like, its own unique surround sound system in there for audio, and it's got this crazy projection set up that you have to make stuff for. And so people just reached out. They were, like, we're really interested in this thing. You want to do a thing? and. Um, I have found an enormous number of opportunities, friendships, and collaborations uh, pretty much from tweeting at people. Not creepily, but um, you like there's something to be said for f find someone's work and then just kind of like seek them out. Be like, hey, do you do commissions? Hey, are you local? Hey, you know, are you, hey. It's really just that like be a friend, like go to things um, and, and don't underestimate the value of, of letting yourself also be the most interesting person in the room. If you hang out only with people who do the same thing you do, uh, you have nothing to talk about but shop talk at a certain point. Um, and I have a friend who's a musician and he loves going to his brother's parties because his brother and all his friends are lawyers and they think he's the most interesting person in the fucking room. <laughs> and they're like, you're a musician? That's so glamorous. Can we come to your concert? And he sells like 30 concert tickets every time he goes to this like lawyer party. Do you know what I mean? So a lot of it has to do with like just like cross fertilization. It doesn't just mean like seek out people with bigger shoes and fill them. It, it actually means like, you know, just find stuff and be like, hey, you know. Um, and if that's hard for you for any reason, you know, um, find somebody who's good at it to kind of be your proxy, which is what I do a lot of the time. I'm like, I'm good stuff. Can you say hi to them for me? You know, um, I, I stand by parties and eat chip silently. Uh, and then I go time. back and I go, okay, here's what we eat. And then Seth introduces me to people. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you know, it's cool. Just talk to people. So I feel like I know what the answer is going to be to this, but uh, you said that you know, incompleteness is worse than you know, completeness and trying to, you know, just never finishing it. Mm -hmm. This, so that's what takes, so it, does that take priority? Let's say like eighty percent of the people in this room are making a Mario clone. Uh -huh. What takes priority? Finishing the Mario clone or not? Finish it. Finish it. Okay. Yeah, finish I think that's Mario clone. Yeah, finish it. Absolutely, absolutely takes priority. And I want to see your Mario clone. Unlike Seth, I'm kind of like I wonder what happens if I play a hundred different versions of Mario in a row. What kind of nightmares will I have? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It is possible if you were just getting started, it will be far easier to make something similar to other things that you have seen because there's a lot of work in designing something. Especially with neocolonialism, I, I took existing um, tropes and, and just sort of intentionally played with them. So, so uh, it's sort of like the anti civilization in a lot of ways, and it takes turn-based strategy and sort of like flips it on its head and talks about what, what does it mean to expand your borders and what does it mean to accumulate resources, like what is the actual consequence of that. Uh, but Undertale. Undertale, yeah. exactly. And, and Undertale, which is, which is, uh, 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 RPG inside out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And But the, the thing about that is like, how, how would you really think about what hasn't been done? You know what I mean? Because like, you got to do something that's possible within our 3D dimension, you know? <laughs> So it's gonna have to be, I mean, you know, you got your idea from somewhere, like they said in some time in their talk. So you know what I mean? To like think that you're gonna come up with something completely new is ridiculous, and that's why it's so, you know, you have like hundred year spans where everyone does sort of the same thing before something new comes along. So like, if you have a really good imagination and you want to make a game that's like some crazy thing, then that's what's gonna happen. And to like question whether or not 
you know, that's not going to happen or something? You know what I mean? It's just like a ridiculous question. Yeah, make your thing. Make a thing. If, if you don't make the thing, you don't make the thing. If you make the thing, you do. And it's probably been done before. Snail <laughs> <laughs> with, and like, you kind of have to, like, snail along. That's genius. Like, the, contro like the, um, the, the controls are, like, I think on your joints, and you have to, like, snail motion. Yeah, like that. <laughs>